So originally, I actually entitled this video Origin of Life Part 2, because this is a continuation of my quest to discover how life formed on planet Earth, based on several recent studies, based on the studies you can find in the description below. And so in this video, we're going to continue this discussion based on some of the recent studies that you can find in the description below. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and so let's discuss, or let's try to discover, how life possibly started on planet Earth. Now before we start with this video, I kind of have to briefly summarize the previous one for those of you who have not seen it, or for those of you who don't intend on watching it. Why not though? It's kind of fun. Anyway, that video was about RNA. Actually, this is DNA. This is RNA. So it was about the idea known as the RNA world, with some of the recent discoveries that have definitively showed us that RNA molecule could have been responsible for the evolution of complex life on our planet with scientists going as far as creating a kind of a miniaturized self-evolving system involving RNA molecules, involving some other parts, that would create a tiny miniaturized ecosystem involving parasites that existed entirely by itself. Although in this case, if you're looking at bacteria, this is just a visual representation. It's almost impossible for us to visualize this using RNA, simply because it's just a little bit too small. But the idea here is still kind of similar. It created a system where RNA molecules were basically sort of evolving by themselves, which at least in theory could have then led to the evolution of DNA molecules and the formation of more complex things like cells and so on. Now that's of course just an idea, that's just a theory, but it's still an important first step in trying to understand how life might have formed on our planet. More details in that video from before that you can find in the description. But it's a very interesting hypothesis that in theory could be tested by discovering life somewhere else out there in the solar system. Here's the thing though. Okay, so let's just say that this is correct, that RNA somehow was able to evolve and eventually create life on our planet. The question is, how exactly did RNA molecules form on the planet to begin with? How exactly did things go from just organic molecules to more complex RNA chains? Now obviously scientists can sort of speculate and suggest certain chemical reactions, but you have to prove this somehow, you have to try to recreate this in a lab. And that's precisely what some of the recent studies did. There are actually several studies in this case, all of which you can as always find in the description below, but it's this one specifically that was recently published in the Journal of Astrobiology that's the most exciting. Synthesis of polyRNA molecules in prebiotic raw glasses. A study that the scientists in this case even suggest could be recreated in simple environments like a high school. A high school lab, that is. And that's super, super interesting. A study that, to some extent, might have officially discovered at least one way for organic molecules to create complex chains, and in this case, chains that resemble RNA. With all of this being relatively quick, in this case, you can actually see that it only took approximately 144 hours, with the chain growing longer and longer as the time progressed. More importantly, all of this was happening spontaneously, entirely by itself, and it was also happening really fast. The scientists in this case refer to this as a catalytic reaction. But what exactly did they use? They used nothing but glass. And specifically, rock glass. Okay, first of all, what exactly is glass? I mean, it's something we use every day, but what is it? Well, by definition, glass is what's known as an amorphic solid. It's essentially not a crystal. It doesn't have a very standard crystallized form. So this is not glass. As a matter of fact, a crystal is practically the opposite of glass. Because the structure inside the glass is usually more hectic and very random. And it's also something that's usually produced from the liquid form. But I guess the easiest way to imagine what glass is, is by literally trying to see how it's created. So if you take any liquid, let's just say lava in this case, and you then let it cool down extremely slowly, it will turn into crystal. Whereas if you suddenly cool down this lava almost instantly, it will turn into glass. So it's really the cooling process that determines if something becomes glass or crystal. I mean, I'm kind of simplifying things here, but that's the gist of the difference. As a matter of fact, you might have heard before that glass is basically a liquid that's just flowing extremely slowly, and that to some extent is correct, but not really for the purposes we need it for today. We're going to refer to it as an amorphic solid. Here's actually one of the more common glasses. This is from the volcano in Hawaii known as Kilauea. And here's another type of glass from the same location, but this one is semi-transparent. So glasses do come in different shapes and sizes. But it's really the process of this rapid cooling that usually forms things into glass. And in our case, we're only concerned with volcanoes. Volcanoes that were present on early Earth. 
during the period that's usually referred to as the Hadean period, when Earth and obviously other planets like Mars and Venus were also really hot and potentially possessed very similar conditions. And here we know that a lot of volcanic glass was forming everywhere, with some of this glass even formed during the very frequent impact collisions, many of which were so powerful that they would create huge amounts of glass everywhere around the location. And so this was happening for millions and hundreds of millions of years, and to some extent even happens today, but to a much smaller extent. And actually some of the studies from the James Webb Telescope are going to be taking a look at various early planets around the galaxy, with some of them currently being in the same state that Earth was billions of years ago, and some of these studies might discover some of this basaltic glass on the surface of these planets as well. But more importantly, we know that Mars also has this, quite a lot of it, and even today quite a lot of glass is formed on Mars through various collisions. On top of these, these early collisions very likely delivered a lot of other material, including things like, for example, nickel, which in this case the scientists behind the study believe was responsible for making more complex nucleoside triphosphates responsible for making longer RNA chains. With borate, the stuff that we usually find in borax, very likely controlling the reaction and also being delivered by asteroids as well. The asteroid collisions mixed with volcanism on the planet very likely create all of the necessary conditions for the same reaction they were able to recreate in the lab. The reaction involving the production of RNA from very simple organic molecules with just the simple compounds that would be delivered by asteroids and created by various volcanoes. But I guess the question is, so what exactly was the experiment? Well, the brilliancy of this experiment is the fact that it was so simple. All the scientists did in this case was combine ribonucleoside triphosphates and incubated them with rock glasses similar to those present on early Earth. All this was done in room temperatures, approximately 25 degrees Celsius. And what's interesting is that almost right away all of this started to convert into these so-called polyribonucleic acids, with longer and longer chains forming within just a few hours. And all of this the scientists reported to be quite catalytic, meaning that it was actually increasing in speed with all of this happening super super fast. And so in theory, if you were to let this run for a few months, it might be actually possible to produce some really complex, really long RNA molecules. More importantly, the glass itself is not consumed, so it can actually continue the reaction for a long time. But chemically speaking, the more important part is the stability of the entire system. And in this case, they actually believe that it's these other elements, like borax and nickel, that seem to control the reaction. For example, borate in this case seems to manage the formation of ribose, the R letter in RNA whereas stability of the reaction could also be possibly provided by the volcanic sulfur dioxide, which would be generally present everywhere on early Earth, allowing the formation of really large reservoirs of organic minerals. And so in this case, the study and this model really sort of explains how the molecules went from being really simple, possibly just containing one or two atoms, to being way more complex and containing really large chains, which would eventually turn into complex RNA and that could then lead to that RNA world model we've discussed in the previous video. And since we know Mars has gone through very similar changes in its early history, it's important to try to see if life has ever evolved here as well using similar conditions. And so if one day we do discover early life on Mars, it means that something similar could have happened pretty much everywhere in a galaxy. This could be an extremely common process and it could be occurring all over the place right now. But I guess the more important discovery in this case is if we don't find anything on Mars. And that's actually the bigger question here. If we find that Mars never had the life, and life has only formed on planet Earth, that's where the mystery begins. What exactly happened on Earth to actually create us? Why Earth and why not Mars? These are really big questions we cannot answer yet. But there are actually other questions from the study that we cannot answer either. For example, when it comes to the RNA building blocks, we still don't really understand how they came to have relatively similar general shapes and relatively similar what's known as homochirality, the principle of handedness in organic molecules. A very simple explanation here would be, look at your hands. You have the left hand and the right hand. Generally, they are similar in structure, but they obviously are mirror images of one another. Something similar happens in organic molecules, and it just so happens that on Earth, both RNA and DNA seem to have extremely similar handedness. Oh, and obviously there's a video about this as well, with a potential solution to this problem, which I'm not going to spoil it just yet. Check out the video in the description, but there's actually a very strong suggestion from that previous study that the handedness of RNA and DNA on our planet 
is caused by the universe itself. Uh, it's a pretty interesting study, but I'm not going to spoil it in this video. Anton, are you trying to get more views on those older videos? Of course I am. That's exactly what I'm trying to do. And also because that was one of the most brilliant discoveries in the last few years. With some other unanswered questions being in regards to the connections between the complex nucleotides, and specifically what encouraged certain types of connections between certain types of nucleotides, and prevented other connections from forming. And one of the more important questions that Mars can help us answer is really because it seems to have never had any continental drift or plate tectonics. And because of this, a lot of this early rock that used to be present on Mars is still present there even today. And so some of the future missions to Mars could help us discover a lot of these different minerals, these glasses, and things like borate to help us understand how this could have happened here as well. And the thing is, according to the scientists in this paper, this process would have been extremely efficient. As a matter of fact, in this case, they suggest that a single, relatively small asteroid, approximately a few metric tons in size, would create the conditions on the surface of the planet to produce approximately one gram of RNA per day. Based on the production of these glasses and the uh, introduction of a lot of other minerals as well. And so according to their study, this is an extremely effective process by which RNA could have been produced on early Earth and early Mars. But as always, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. So in this case, a lot more studies are needed to try to confirm this, but more importantly, we really have to try to go to Mars and see if we can find something there. And if we don't find anything there, it means that Earth is unique. And if we do find something there, it means that life could be present everywhere in the galaxy, at least according to these recent studies. Nevertheless, this is an important next step in trying to discover how life might have formed on our planet and how it could potentially form on other planets out there somewhere in our galaxy. A question that we're desperately trying to answer by using as much knowledge from planet Earth as we can. And so until future studies or until we talk about the third part of the origin of life on the planet, that's all I wanted to mention. Make sure to subscribe because there are going to be more investigations in the future and come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe subscribe, maybe share this video with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, and maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.